My Raspberry Pi Pico reaction game is now complete. My last few videos have covered setting up the Pico with CircuitPython, powering the Pico, controlling the NeoPixels, and displaying messages on an LCD display. In this video, I'm going to start explain how I put together the project using a breadboard and then soldering it up on an Adafruit thermoprotive breadboard. The LED reaches I'm also the going to position. explain about the enclosure, which I designed in a couple of hours but took over two days to 3D print. Hit. That's one point. The game is a reaction game where the LEDs move backwards and forwards across the strip and the player has to hit the button to stop the LED on the centre pixel. The game is controlled it's using again. a Raspberry Pi another Pico, point. connected to a strip of 44 RGB LED NeoPixels, a 1602 Each LCD display, a, little a bit start button and a, little and bit a giant game button. It's programmed in CircuitPython. Hit the again. enclosure is designed three in FreeCAD and 3D printed. This is the circuit design on a breadboard. There's quite a lot going on and it's compact fits on a half plus breadboard, which is a typical size. I'll go through the different parts so that you can see it more clearly. For more details of the components used, then see the accompanying page on my website, penguintutor.com. I'm going to show how this can be built upon a breadboard. This isn't necessarily the order that I created the circuit, but it breaks it down into different features so you can follow through. Place the Pico on the breadboard. This is as far to the left as possible to make it easy to connect the USB connection for programming it, etc. Now I did the power connections. The jack socket represents a socket used for connecting a 5 volt power supply. In my case, I used a 5 volt 4 amp power supply with a barrel plug. The power jack is connected to the bottom power rail. I've also connected the ground power rail to the top ground power rail as well, just for additional convenience of wiring, as the number of wires that I connect is quite high. To power the Pico, I've connected ground to pin 3. Any of the Pico ground pins could have been used. I've then used a shockley diode to pin 39, the VSYS pin. The diode is shown off the breadboard because I ran out of space. When I created the soldered version, I've soldered it underneath the Pico, which I'll explain later. I've also connected the 3v3 pin on pin 36 to the top red power rail. I've already explained about the different power pins on the Pico in my earlier video, which I'll link to in the description. I've now added the LCD display. The display has four connections, a 5 volt and ground, to power the LCD display, then the SDA serial data and SCL serial clock connections. The LCD display uses I2C and has built-in pull-up resistors which connect the I2C bus to the 5 volt supply. This is something I find quite frustrating as it's not necessary but to protect the Pico I decided to use an Adafruit I2C bidirectional level shifter. I used the Pico GP16 for SDA, which connects to A1 on the level shifter and then from B1 to the LCD. I used the Pico GP17 for SCL, which connects to A2 on the level shifter and then from B2 to the LCD display. I'll link to my earlier video with full details of the wiring, about my gripe with the I2C pull-up resistors and how to program the LCD display using CircuitPython. I've now added the NeoPixel strip. In this case, I have a 44 pixel strip. That needs quite a bit of power, which is the reason for the 5 volt jack. The power is taken straight from that. There is then just a single connection needed to the NeoPixel. The signal for the NeoPixel should be around 5 volts, but the GPIO ports on the Pico is only 3.3 volts. With a short distance from the circuit to the pixel strip, I could have just used the 3.3 volt signal straight from the GPIO port. But as I was already using a level shifter and had some spare connections on that, I went via the level shifter. I used GP22 for the connection to the NeoPixel, which I connected to the level shifter and then onto the data in port of the NeoPixel strip. Again, I've got another video which goes into this in more detail. I've now added the two buttons, which are pushed to make switches. The blue button, shown on the left, is a giant button and the green one on the right is a standard arcade size button. These connect from GP2 for the green button and GP3 for the blue button. The other end of the buttons connects to ground. 
These use the internal pull-up resistors of the Pico to give a high when the buttons aren't pressed and which then goes low when the buttons are pressed. Finally, the buttons I used include a built-in LED, which I've represented here as an LED alongside the buttons. The LEDs include built-in resistors intended for a 12 volt supply. Driving these at 5 volts is not as bright as if you use 12 volts, but it is sufficient to see that they are lit. These LEDs need more than 3.3 volts from a Pico, so I've used a simple MOSFET switch to switch these, so they can use the 5 volt supply. They have a 470 ohm resistor to the gate of the MOSFETs. These are connected to GP18 and GP19. And this is the finished circuit. The design is included on my website if you'd like to download it to follow it yourself. I'm going to leave the circuit here for now, but I'll explain later how I turn this into a more permanent version. But first, a quick explanation about the code. The code is written in CircuitPython. I've already covered the main parts of the code in my earlier videos on the LCD display and the NeoPixels, so I won't go into detail. Note that this is written for the LCD backpack with the PCF8574. For an Adafruit backpack, then see the explanation in my earlier video. The code starts with a one second delay to ensure the LCD and NeoPixels are powered up first. It then sets up the details of the pins used. You can change these if you want to use different pins. Then sets up I2C for the LCD display and the buttons. Then set up the LEDs for the buttons and the NeoPixels. And the main program code is in a function called main. There is a startup sequence displaying messages to the LCD display and flashing the LEDs. This is useful to show that it's working correctly before starting the game. It's then in a while true loop, which will run forever. Inside that, there's another loop, which will loop until the giant button is pressed. This loop just moves which LED is lit one position along the strip. And then when it reaches the end, it does it in the opposite direction. When the button is pressed, then it moves out to the next block of code, which will determine if it was stopped at the correct place and it updates the score on the LCD display and either continues or waits for the start button to be pressed as appropriate, depending upon whether it was hit at the right position or not. Then there are a couple of functions used to remove duplicate code. The flash lights function flashes all the near pixels the specified number of times and color. The pixel move function is used to move the position of the lit near pixel. The source code is available on GitHub and linked from my website. A breadboard is great for designing circuits as it makes it easy to swap components, etc. It does not, however, make a good permanent solution as it's quite easy for components and particularly wires to get pulled out of the board. For a more permanent solution, you could create a custom printed circuit board. But one other option is to use a strip board or an Adafruit Perma Proto breadboard which is what I've used here. The protoboard has the same pin layout as the breadboard, so you can move the components over one by one onto the board and keep exactly the same positions. One difference is I used female headers to insert the Pico and the level shifter into, rather than soldering them direct. This means that I can reuse them for other projects if I don't need them for this project anymore. I cut the wires quite short to keep the board tidy and I soldered the diode to the board underneath where the Pico will go. This allowed me to keep it all tidy inside the board. The cathode of the diode is soldered to some wire and covered with heat shrink sleeving to prevent it shorting to any of the other pins on the Pico. I used a three pin JST connector for the NeoPixels and I soldered male to female jumper wires for the LCD display. The jumper wires are not as tight fitting as I'd like, so I used a bit of hot melt glue to hold them in place on the LCD backpack. Again, this will allow me to reuse the LCD display in a different project in future. 
Finally, I added wires for the buttons, button LEDs and the power jack. These are solid core wires, although you could have used stranded wires instead. For the buttons and LEDs, the wires are crimped onto suitable connectors, which also allows for the reuse of the buttons and LEDs if required. The power connector just had solder lugs, so I soldered directly to those. This resulted in a circuit which is permanent, but with the option to reuse many of the components if I changed the design or wanted to use it in a different project. Here is the enclosure, which I designed in FreeCAD. It's designed for a 10cm button for the reaction button, an arcade style button for the start game, and an LCD display. There's a hole on the side for the power input and another for the NeoPixel connection. I was hoping to put a grommet in the hole for the NeoPixels, but because of the scaffold used during the 3D printing, I haven't installed one at the moment. There are countersunk holes in the top for the screws to fit into, so they are flush with the top of the enclosure. Without the lid, you can see some of the features. There is a screw hole in each corner for the lid to be fastened on. These are made slightly smaller than the size of the screws and then are threaded using a threading tap. There are two stands with holes for mounting the PERMA prototyping board. These use self-tapping screws which go through the board to hold it in place. I've then added a additional three quarter circle which is used to provide additional support against someone hitting the button too hard. Here's the final version after 3D printing and mounting all the components. It took over a day to print the main part of the case and then a few hours to print the lid. The free CAD files are included in the GitHub repository if you'd like to recreate this yourself. The NeoPixels are installed external to the enclosure, mounted on a strip of wood which is intended as a thin shelf. And then this is the final game. There's always room for improvement. One thing it may be worth adjusting is the way that the speed is increased. It's quite good for the first five sequences, but then when it reaches a zero second delay, it's a bit too fast. Yes, managed to get that. And then this is the level where it becomes practically impossible. <laughs> game over. I found this a fun project. Many of my projects are just used for educational purposes. As a result I don't always get as far as having what looks like a complete build with enclosure. Please hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video or learnt anything new. If you're not already a subscriber please subscribe to see more projects in future. Thanks for watching and look forward to seeing you on a future video.